Hey everybody, my name is Anthony Sabatino. Welcome to the Anthony Sabatino Show. I have here Rafi as a guest today. We're going to talk a lot about a few different things, including some real estate and a lot of backstory of his. I wanted to welcome Rafi to the show. Thank you, brother. Thanks for having me, Anthony. It's a pleasure. Yes, absolutely. So we got connected uh, a few weeks back um, as a guest in your podcast, actually. Um, so I was happy to have you on. What I wanted to do for our audience here is you can just give a little bit of backstory. Obviously, I have some context, but just a little bit about who you are, what you do, and then we'll have ourselves a fun conversation. Absolutely. So I'm originally from New York. I was in the Israeli military after my uh, three years of college. I was in infantry. I was a sharpshooter. I spent uh, a year and a half there. I volunteered. You know, it wasn't, it's not required as an American Jew to go there. It was something I've wanted to do for a very, very long time since I was a kid. Wrote it down in my elementary school yearbook and it ended up coming to fruition. You know, whether or not people are supportive of it is a different story. You know, we can go into that or we, we cannot, whichever, whatever you prefer. Um, after my service, I went back and finished my last year of school. Shortly after, moved to South Florida, where I am now. Very happy I did so. So many people are moving here, so it's been fantastic. I, uh, you know, I mean, there's so much to discuss, but we'll kind of uh, merge into what I do now. I, I'm now a realtor and a podcaster, and you know, that's that's what I'm up to now. So, that's amazing. Well, we can definitely dig into some some interesting topics. So, if you want to just give me, because I'm just curious personally, but I'm sure everybody else is too, like. What was it like going into the military at that, at that time? Like, what would that indulge? Like, what did you do? Just, I can't even imagine the experience. Right. So it was, it was without a doubt, the most life-changing year and a half of my life. Uh, ironically, I don't talk about it too much on the podcast unless people ask me about it. Mm -hmm. uh, the training was very intense. You know, I don't know how it is in the American army. I've spoken with some people, but uh, many people seem to know a nice amount about what the Israeli military is like. I mean, they always kind of need the military to be operating. It's not as if uh, they're just shipping people off to different countries and they're just sitting around on bases. Uh, the infantry units are generally very busy, especially the one I was in. We were stationed in the West Bank. So uh, the West Bank is a pretty uh, intense area to say the least. There's a lot going on. There are uh, Arab and Jewish villages on, on hilltops and they're all kind of neighboring each other. So it's a very, it's a very hectic area. There's a lot going on. So we were doing arrests. There were, there we were doing arrests about every week, uh, different units do different arrests. There were riots that happened uh, fairly often uh, in different villages. And they, I mean, uh, I'm very happy to still be alive. I had some instances where I came close to, to losing my life. So I'm very grateful for that. And uh, it, it, it was very intense. I mean, there was a lot going on. You're welcome to ask me any specific questions you have and I'll answer them. Uh, but I mean, the training that, that, I, that I got out of it, the mental push that I, that I had to go through, the, the strenuous activities that they put me through, uh, made it a lot easier to overcome challenges that I go through nowadays because the reality is really nothing I go through day to day is as difficult as the experiences I went through then. It's just a matter of shifting my mind to understand that, okay, this is simply something I, I don't have enough experience in versus the military, which I had to do every single day for that year and a half. So, I mean, uh, particularly one experience, I mean, there's so many, but one in particular, I always think about because it, it always sticks with me every time I'm going through a challenge is one of the first weeks in advanced training. So in the Israeli army, in a, in a standard infantry unit, you have eight months of training. So you have about uh, three and a half months of basic training and you have about four and a half months of advanced training. So once we got into advanced training, we had a week where we went into uh, the bumblefuck nowhere desert and we can curse on this, right? Yeah, we're good. Okay, good. I should have asked you, my, my bad. Um, okay, so we went into the desert and first thing we do is when we get there, and I, I think I was a little bit hungover when I got there on Sunday because every every few weeks they allow you to go off base and go wherever you go. So I decided to get an apartment with a few friends in Jerusalem. And when we got off base, we had that apartment to go to for the weekend. So, you know, we would go out to bars and drink and all that. So uh, Saturday night, I went out a little and early Sunday, we had to be back on base and it was very hot. We were by the, we were neighboring Jordan where our base was. So we, we, we go out to the, to the desert and 
Hold on, let me just, just ignore this one second, sorry. So we go to, we go out to the desert and we walk to this area and there's a bunch of cow shit on the floor. <laughs> and the officer says, all right, guys, get into this, this kind of um, uh, L shape. Well, not an L shape, but more of a, uh, like a C shape. And uh, we all stand there and he goes, okay, pick up, everyone pick up a piece of cow poop and move it to the side. We need to clear this area out for all the bags, all the, the tents, all the uh, military equipment. Forget about us. They didn't care what we slept. But they needed <laughs> to make sure the equipment was on a clean ground. So nobody, everyone hesitates. No one wants to touch it. And he goes, okay. He calls one guy in, into the, the, the middle of the, the group. And he says, pick it up, pick up a piece of poop. He picks it up. And it, it was dry from the sun, but nonetheless, it's poop. He picks it up. It goes, okay, now break it in your hand. And the kid, the guy like looks at him and kind of hesitates. So he picks up his own and he crumples it himself. And so the the I mean, they're pretty, a lot of the guys were pretty young. I drafted at 22, but some of the guys were 18, 19. So he does it. And then he goes, all right, everybody grab it, pick it up, whatever you need to do and throw it to the side. So everyone's literally sitting there, standing there, throwing, <laughs> slinging poop. <laughs> and, uh, okay. Hold on. So everyone, everyone's slinging poop. Anyhow, we, uh, we set up the equipment and we, we had a little something to eat and we set out for a good, I don't know, five hours of just walking in, I don't know, mid nineties, a hundred degree, degree weather with about 60 pounds on our back. And we're going kind of up and down these big hills and I'm, I'm sweating profusely, I'm dying. And uh, we were doing different exercises. We were putting people on stretchers, uh, doing different drills, uh, and finally, it gets to evening. I mean, I'm skipping some of the some of the training, but we we get to to evening, and all of our sweat is already kind of you, you feel like you just took a shower with your clothes on, and now you're going out into freezing conditions because the desert at night is very cold. Yeah. So you don't have any change of clothes. You can't take your clothes off. You're sitting wearing the same boxers for a week and a half, same socks. Um, I'm sure many other militaries go through this sort of thing, but as an American. I just wasn't used to this sort of thing. So we get to, we finally, the, the commander lets us kind of camp somewhere. We didn't have any, any sleeping bags or tents. We kind of just, you know, cracked out on the, on the rocks. Uh, one guy had to replace the other every hour to do guard duty. And all of a sudden it starts pouring rain. So it's freezing cold or we're soaked of sweat. No, no, no towels, no nothing. We're just sitting there and it starts pouring rain. So the, the ground is all muddy now. And I'm thinking, I'm like, fuck, this is really, <laughs> this is not fun. This is not a fun experience. So everyone's kind of complaining and we're all sitting there. And one of, one of the guys had, had cigarettes. He wasn't actually allowed to bring them, but he brought them. And my commander just kind of let us smoke one. Yeah. So uh, we're all sitting there and all of a sudden we all start cracking up laughing. We all start bur bursting out laughing and, uh, that experience to me taught me a very valuable lesson. And that's when you're with the right people, when you have that camaraderie, even in the worst of times, you can see the light, you can see the fun in even a very crappy experience. Uh, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that time. So that, I mean, that was one, what a, one of the many. What a, what a story. And I yeah. think you mentioned it um, a little bit, almost in the middle of that story in the sense that, you know, like everything you go to now, you kind of reference back right? To like these experiences. And one of the things that I find so interesting, and I even find this interesting in, in a lot of different facets of life. Like one of the ways that I look at it is really, really good professional fighters sometimes have really good skills in things like gymnastics or dance or things that, you know, you can move your body really well in. In this particular case, like a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners have had military experience and share that same kind of discipline or same skills associated, you know what I mean? With owning a business. I just find that so interesting. And I feel like you're kind of in that world, right? Where in the real estate game that you're in right now, as well as podcasting, you bring so much of that skill set to the table, right? It has to, it, yeah, it really is all about having the set things that you do, the set schedule that you have every day. And it's all about in the small details, you know, so I'm a newer realtor and I'm a newer podcaster and, and you know, neither of which have blown up, so to speak. Uh, what I do know is I'm putting the right practices into place. And there's a lot, there's a large learning curve that I have, but I know that I'm disciplined and putting in the right practices. I mean, from making my bed to making 100, 200 calls a day, at least 
I know that making my bed is vital to me. Some people may not think it's important, but when I when I know that the first thing I do in the morning is I, I fold my blanket and I put it in the center of the bed, it makes me more centered. I feel more centered. I go and I hit the gym, I finish, I, I pop my creatine, and I take my two pills of creatine, I take my whey protein, that routine, that constant, I look, I, I'm excited to pop open the creatine and take the pills. It's just, it's, it's silly to sum up to some people. They're like, well, I don't understand the enjoyment in that, but I know I'm fueling my muscle. I'm putting more energy in my body. I'm, I'm stronger. All these little details make me feel amazing. So uh, then I, I go, I hit the, hit the calls. I, uh, you know, set up any appointments I have for the day, keep making calls if I have nothing else to do, but everything is scheduled. And, and uh, I mean, that's, 101 that's entrepreneurship 101 because i don't have a boss sitting over me telling me what i need to do 100 percent. and to your point you know with just folding your blanket and putting in the center of the bed right like i think just at purest form you're just starting your day off with the w you know what i mean absolutely like, bro. It just gets the ball rolling and in your direction as opposed to already starting off the day behind so i think there's a multitude of different benefits to you know making your bed first thing in the morning and having that routine set in place but i think just starting your day off with a win you know really builds momentum from there Sure. What are your, what are your, some of your morning routines, man? Definitely making my bed first thing in the morning. There's I, so I agree with you in the sense that it makes me feel more centered. Like it, to me. So when I make my bed in the morning, it's the first thing I do as soon as I get out of bed, it kind of sets me up with the foundation of, to build off of. That's the way I kind of look at it. It's like once that's done, okay, now I can start building. If I don't do that for whatever reason, I already feel like I have to like go back a step and mm -hmm. fix what I haven't done first. So I never like starting my day off without that. So it feels like I'm building on shaky ground. That's kind of like the analogies that I put in my head. Um, from there, I love exercising first thing in the morning, as opposed to, you know, in the evening, and the afternoon. I find having the routine in the morning, it provides, like you're kind of saying, more of a structure, which then leads and leaks into the rest of the day. If I'm putting That's it in right. the afternoon or the, the evening, I feel like I'm injecting it in places just to fit it in. It's not necessarily, the, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't build momentum. And I feel like outside of the health benefits, of course, the mental and emotional benefits is more around the structure, like you're saying. So outside, you know, really exercise in the morning and, and making the bed of my big things. And then I'm right into work from there. Awesome. I'm, I'm glad we have that in common. Uh, just a caveat on the working out in the morning for people who are, you know, some people listening to this a bit. Ah, I hate mornings. I need to work out in the evenings. It helps me relax. I uh, have more time. My, my feeling in working out in the morning is it's better than any coffee. And you have a tighter time frame. So it's much easier to have to have a structured schedule when say you wake up at six. Let's say you work out at you have work at nine, say you are nine to five, or you wake up at seven, you go from seven to eight, you have an hour window now. You know, you have to factor in traveling, you may have to factor in breakfast, whatever it is that you do. But when you work out in the morning, you have a much tighter time frame which means that you're generally going to be a lot more disciplined once you hit the gym, as opposed to going at six or seven or eight, everything's up in the air. Now you might decide to talk to Wendy for 20 minutes. You mm -hmm. might decide to just spaz out on your phone because you have what you feel is that, that uh, longer amount of time. In actuality, we all have the same amount of time for mm -hmm. me. And for you, I, I imagine my workouts are already done in the morning. I start my day. I can now decide once it hits, let's say five, six, seven o'clock, do I want to work more or do I simply want to shut off the computer for the day? But now I have an empty window until I go to bed at say between 10 and 11 o'clock to do whatever I need to do. But my workout's already finished. For me, that's a world of difference. I might be able to lift a little bit more heavy later in the evening, but I'm willing to sacrifice that. And to be it really, it's such a minuscule difference anyhow. It's so worth it. I, I couldn't stress the, the morning workouts enough. And for anyone who isn't a morning person, it's a habitual thing. You build the habit. And once you build the habit, it's, you can't go back. You can't go back. It's so, it's so exhilarating. I love that you mentioned that. So I don't, I don't drink coffee either. I, I've mm -hmm. always found that it's a tough pill for me to swallow, to like depend on a source of caffeine to create my energy for the day. And I never wanted to fall into that, that, you know, trap or habit. Not that it's necessarily a bad thing. Coffee's great it's just i never wanted to depend on it so i never wanted to create that from the get-go um, yeah. yeah so like working on the beginning though it gets your day moving immediately it's almost like a cold shower you know like it just gets your body moving 
in a way that matters. And something else you mentioned too that I want to touch on in the sense that like you have that open window towards the end of the day that you, you know, it's tough to fill. I'm a big fan of like when you use a calendar or anything that you're using to structureize your day, studying your gaps is even more important sometimes than studying or, or monitoring what you do have locked in the calendar. Like, oh, real quick, think about this. I'm sorry, to, I, I, you're getting me excited. Especially if you are an employee and you work for someone else, if you get off at five, you now have from five until whenever you go to bed, you have complete free time. Say, I mean, you might have a family, you might be married, but say you're single, or even if you aren't, if you know that the gym is done, you now have that time to do what you need to do. And if you want to go and build a side hustle, you don't have to worry that the gym is going to get in the way. And what ends up happening is you say, oh, should I, should I work on the side hustle or should I work out? It becomes an either or. But if the workout's already in the bag, that's it. You don't have to worry about it. It's over. It's done. You're 100. And I love that you kind of mentioned that, that either or, right? Like I'm a, I, we, I think we even talked about this on, on your podcast, right? Where the, it's less of an either or, especially in the, the branding world, as opposed to an and process. Like how much more can we add? right mm -hmm. that's a perfect example of how you just said it there you know and even from your experience right like in terms of side hustles and having your own podcast like you're probably perfect to you know speak to this in the sense that you you set this up exactly how you're just saying you know like you set yourself up to where you're able to do the gym and do it a side hustle i.e the podcast and build that up on the side and it's never really taking from you right like you're, you're you're adding to your life as opposed to trying to sacrifice and mitigate from there absolutely dude Absolutely. I'm very, I'm, I'm very glad that I set it up this way. I mean, does it take some level of time? Does it take up some part of my weekend? Yes, but it is minuscule. I mean, the, the time that I have to spend on my podcast is laughable. Um, I, I obviously, once marketing comes into play more and once I'm willing to, to um, forgetting the word already, uh, when you give something, you give time or, or money or energy to something else. Um, huh? Delegate? Yeah, well, de yeah, delegate can work. It wasn't the word I was looking for. But anyhow, uh, once I'm willing to do that, I mean, it may take up some more time, but I mean, I plan on delegating everything anyhow. I mean, I delegate the editing. I plan on having a man an assistant to handle any calls or emails. Um, I plan on har uh, hiring, you know, social media marketing. So once that's all done, I mean, all I really need to do is, is decide who I have on as a guest or decide who I who I, which podcast I join as a guest, have the conversation. Obviously there needs to be a level of brainstorming in terms of how I'd like the edits to be. But once I have a, a, a system in place and a team in place, they can also give me their feedback. And I always appreciate their feedback. So, uh, you know, these, if anything, the more you do something and the more successful you become at it and the more capital you have for that thing, you, you can actually spend less time doing it. And that's the beauty of it. It definitely is. And we talked about yeah. that a ton. On, yeah, we on, did. Sure did. Yeah. yeah. So let's, let's transition a little bit. I'm really curious. So we right. talked a little bit about, you know, your real estate journey. I'd love to hear kind of how you kind of took your first step into the real estate journey in the world. Okay. So uh, quite honestly, and I think it's important to mention this and I'm not particularly proud of it, but uh, you know, there, there are high interest loans um, so forever, we'll, we'll, we'll cut the grass here and call it what it is, uh, loan sharking. And unfortunately, I gave that a go for a little bit because I heard there was a lot of money in it and there's a loophole. It's, it's not illegal. It's legal. It's technically not a loan. It's, a, it's an advance. And there are people who are going to hear this that do it. They're like, ah, you're throwing us under the bus. Fortunately, I think it's always going to be something that exists. Uh, there are people that will always take them. They're generally business owners who aren't in a very good position. And so I did that for a little bit over a year once I graduated and I made a decent amount of money doing it. Uh, once COVID hit, I decided to stop doing it. We, we had like one of those boiler rooms. We really felt like Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, you know, the drugs, weren't, the drugs weren't involved, but it's just, it's, it's a business where you aren't building a reputation. You're just taking what you can get. And once COVID hit, I realized that I want to be doing a lot uh, I want to be doing well by people and I want to help people who actually want to be helped. And these are people that unfortunately are just taking this because they don't have an, a better option. You know, they're people with very low credit. Um, just, you know, explaining it to people who might not know. Yeah. Um, they're low credit or they have criminal backgrounds or they, their businesses are just doing terribly. They don't have the capital. So they take these, these daily or weekly advances, you know, these, these advances on their credit. And uh, 
Uh, long story short, COVID, uh, I know it wasn't a blessing for many people, but it gave me a lot of perspective and it allowed me to pivot into something else. And I knew I didn't want a salary job. I want the ability to make as much as I can and, and have the freedom to come and go as I please and really be autonomous. And real estate gave me that ability. And uh, one of my very close friends, he, uh, give him a little shout out, his name is Itamar. He, before I started doing this, uh, this loan thing, he suggested that I get into real estate. He thought I'd be great at it. And at the time, I just didn't think much of it. I ended up doing this other thing. And once COVID hit, I said, you know what? I, I got to do real estate. This is, it, it makes sense. Studied, took the exam, failed the first time, took it again, aced it, and uh, interviewed at Douglas Elliman. Wasn't a huge fan of it. They, uh, they, they were too restrictive on what I could post on social media. Uh, interviewed at Keller Williams. Really liked the guy, this guy, Lee Rosa, the guy who, who kind of runs the office. Really liked him, got along with him. Very happy here. It's, it's going very well. And, and what I like so much more about real estate and in any business, you have people that are, that are slimy and don't do things with integrity. But uh, in real estate, if you do what you need to do and you, you have a good mentor, you have a great mentor and you, you follow in his or her footsteps, you can do the right thing build a great reputation and still do very, very well. And uh, I, I'd like to believe that for most of the human race, uh, or most of the human population, they'll do, people in general will do a lot better if they choose to do the right thing. It may take longer. It may mean that you're not going to have instant success. Uh, but I think the the longer road is the, is the better road. So, you know, that's my take. And, and I'm very blessed to have gone through that other experience. So I, I have perspective and I, I, I see what an, another kind of business could be. And I'm very, very glad that I'm doing what I'm doing now. So that's so cool. And, you know, every, everybody's beginning experience is different, you know, and it's neither worse or better, I feel like, than many others in, in so many cases because it's shaping exactly the road that you had to go down to understand and appreciate you know, what it is that you're doing. Um, and I think even more so the delayed gratification is so key. You know, the amount of times that even myself, you know, there's, there's certain points where I almost purposely like created this scenario that I want to delay something that I could have maybe gotten sooner, but in a more strategic manner to make it more long-term sustainable. I think it, it just packs more of a punch. And sometimes that's given on purpose. And sometimes that's, you know, fed to you in a silver spoon, whether you like it or not. I just think either way, it is so potent when you can really appreciate what delayed gratification gives you. And I think you just came from a really good place of that. 100%. It's just very hard for people to, to, to wrap their head around because there's no telling as to how long yeah. it, it's going to, you know, how long it's going to take to receive that, that special day, so to speak, you know, to, yeah. to finally see the, uh, the fruits of your labor. It's, it's very, it's difficult. So most people want that quick win. They're hoping to blow up on TikTok tomorrow. They're hoping that they, they get that $10 million real estate listing a month into selling real estate. Yeah. Some people do it. Some people get lucky. The chances of you being that person, extremely, extremely slim. So, you know, that's the reality of life. I mean, whether you believe in God or not, the, uh, the way of the world is that the, uh, the sweetest things come when you work hard for them, you know, when you implement the right things and when you're willing to really put your head down humbly and say, okay, this is going to take a long time. So I better get, I better, you know, buckle up and get ready for it. So you're, it so, you're so right. And it's funny that the, I guess the coincidence of timing. So I just got up a client call like a half an hour ago when we were messaging back and forth. And one of the things I was talking about with him was the idea of like relinquishing the control of all these outcomes, especially in like a business sense, because in many times it's just delaying the inevitable anyway. So there's so many times where like, even to your point, where you're constantly trying to like wait for when's your day, when's your moment, when you're going to get your fruits of your labor. And many times that like, like just like, white knuckling effect of trying to get it sometimes delays it even further and further and further and pushes you away mm -hmm. what you're supposed to be focusing on and that's something that is just overly pre like prevalent almost in every facet of business in some way shape or form everybody's got it in some way and i'm no different i'm not putting myself on a pedestal we all mm -hmm. like do it in a way but it's just i think it's important to acknowledge even for the audience how often that happens you know, it's interesting because it just got me thinking. We, I think every person makes that mistake, even people who are well-seasoned in business. Yeah. They, the idea of just kind of going after what you want, but not trying to force it too much. 
-hmm. is true about like anything in, in life. It's true about that with, with relationships, right? So like, even if you're like, even if you understand, say you're a guy or you're a girl and you, you pretty, you, you understand the other, uh, you know, say you're a guy, you understand, you may understand female psychology better than the average guy or vice versa. You're still from time to time going to get in your head and do things that don't make sense because you're human, right? Yeah. And you're going to, you're going to look at yourself and say, I know better than that. Why did I do that? <laughs> yeah. Right. But it's just, it happens. So, I mean, you, you hope to, to mitigate it as much as possible. And once you've made the mistakes enough times and you've been through it, then you tend to make the mistakes far less, but from time to time, you're going to maybe, you know, push that business idea that shouldn't have been, or, you know, follow up with that possible, uh, you know, business partner more than you should have and kind of just, you know, continue to, to live your life and do your thing and allow that person to come to you more as opposed to, you know what I mean? And it, it seems to be true in anything, I think. I, I think it's just sometimes it's hard to gauge how, why, when, you know, and that takes a level of emotional intelligence and that, you know. Yeah, no, and many times, and I, I really find this valuable, like talking to somebody who has a lot more life experience than what you're doing. A lot of times when you say the words like, hey, whoever you're talking to, like, when was there ever a time in your life, you know, where you really like needed something to happen or wanted it to happen a certain way, and then it didn't happen, and it ended up a whole lot better than you thought it would have. And many times mm -hmm. the answer is yes. And like, it happens in a whole different, like you were just to what you were saying, like it happens in almost every facet of life in general. But the idea that you have to almost relinquish that control is so hard. Because you, you just the idea of not being able to dictate whether that happens seems it makes you very vulnerable, which is hard. Yeah, because I think we all want to be in control of as much as much as we can. Yeah. The idea of not being in control of something is scary. Yeah. It's like when we can control an outcome, we're as humans, we're, we always want to know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So for instance, that's, you know, we're so afraid of death because we don't know when it's going to happen. Yeah. Which is much, it's much better that way than knowing when our death would be. I, I'd, I'd pref much prefer not to know. Yeah. Uh, anyone who says otherwise, I think is a little, it's kind of silly. But um, I mean, that's, that's the whole, that's the, excuse my Portuguese, that's the fuckery of life is, is <laughs> not, is to such a large degree, we don't know. Right. And uh, but that's also what makes it beautiful, because that's what creates that fire within us, that excitement. This might fail. This might work, but I'm going to try it, you know, and uh, and I, I feel what often what often happens is when things are going well. Sometimes you can't even foresee how well they actually go, kind of what you were saying, where, you know, say someone becomes successful, they end up things end up turning out so much better and they end up having so much more than they even thought was possible yeah. because they gave themselves the chance and believed in and believed in themselves and were willing to go that we're willing to to run that marathon long enough for it to come to fruition 100 percent, 100 and patience is so important in that like it's 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 directly correlated in a way to the idea of wanting to control everything and always know what's going to happen next but the idea of just accepting that it's going to take a long time most of the time and to just buy into that. That's what I think is where most things differ, right? Is like, if you can lean into certain commitments, it changes your belief systems and all the rest. Like if you can lean into the fact that like it's, you need to be patient and it's going to take a lot longer. It kind of reshapes some of the other anxieties and issues that come along with say running a business or whatever else is going on or working a job, right? Like mm -hmm. if you can just accept, and when I say lean into, right, what I mean by that is like, you, if you look at an idea that maybe doesn't seem perfect in your head and it makes you a little uncomfortable, if you just force yourself into it and like really just allow yourself to accept that as truth because you know it's the right direction you want to go down, it does end up shaping some of the other perspectives in your life that do make more of an impact later on. Maybe not that same business or job that I was talking about, but maybe something in five years, you know, it kind of pays dividends is my point, which is interesting. Absolutely. Yeah, the idea of compounding is, is it, it, this is kind of what you're talking, because you said pays yeah. dividends. So I, it, it, only, it only makes me think of the longer you're involved in something, the more you can build on it. And, and what's so beautiful is when you look back at the beginning of it uh -huh. and you think about how tough the early stage of it is. So, you know, with real estate and, and the podcast, even though I'm newer at both of them, I can look back at the beginning and see what I've been able to build on, right? So I've kind of cemented certain parts of it and now I can just build from there. Yeah, it's kind of like and making bread in that scenario. Like you, you create your own momentum that way, which is, is yeah. very 
It's amazing. And it's so important to pat yourself on the back from time to time and say, okay, well, even though I'm nowhere near, near where, where I want to be, I'm so much further along than I thought I'd be. Mm -hmm. And using that momentum and that, and that pat on the back is so important because as much as other people might do it as well, you need to be your own biggest fan. You always need to be your own biggest fan because no one's going to do it for you. 100%. So, you know. so interesting left turn here, which I think is cool to talk about. So I think in general, obviously, I don't know nearly as much about real estate as you do and I'm not an affiliated in the industry really at all. But there's mm -hmm. a lot of you know, different content, things like that, that I find interesting and, and obviously aesthetically pleasing. And one of the things that I always to your point earlier in the podcast where you mentioned that so many people are moving right to the South Florida area. Um, I always find it so interesting, the difference between like what's going on in New York real estate, as opposed to real estate in Miami, anything that you found now, obviously being in both, that is like an apparent difference. I don't know the real estate market in New York well enough because I wasn't a realtor there. Okay. So I do have friends that are, I mentioned my friend Itamar, who is a New York agent and, uh, you know, he can definitely give you a lot more insight. The New York market is still hot. I mean, that's, it's still moving. I definitely, the luxury market is, is on fire for sure. Uh, I do think what, what I'm seeing, and I'm, I'm no data guy as far as New York is concerned, what I do see is people are still, many people are moving to suburbia. So a lot of people seem to be moving to Long Island. Uh, you know, they're moving to the five towns, to Queens, places like that, just trying to get a little bit more bang for their buck. But I, I don't, I mean, I don't see the New York market. I mean, it, it had a slower time. There are still New Yorkers that are definitely leaving, uh, but there are loyal New Yorkers who are gonna stay regardless. I do think that all these mandates and all these strict policies are, are hurting uh, New York, but uh, I mean, New York is New York. It's, it's, gonna, it's gonna remain a powerhouse. I can't see that changing, but you know, it definitely, don't get me wrong. Florida definitely gained a lot from, from COVID and all these New Yorkers coming here. Canada, Cali, all these, uh, quite frankly, the more of the liberal states have, have really, uh, you know, a lot of people have come from those states to come here, to live here. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense. And I always, I've seen that too, like that, that, I don't know the right word, but I guess just the flocking down, right? There's been a lot, especially the past year or two. Have you found, and this is just, you know, plain curiosity too have you found anything that like purely in miami like in the florida real estate market anything that's just different that you wouldn't have expected coming from new york because that's something that i always think too if i'm in one place and i'm trying to project what i would imagine to the other you know what i mean like i always kind of base my experiences of what i know anything mm -hmm. that you've found that you didn't expect maybe in the florida real estate place um not really. I mean, I think at the end of the day, real estate is a very flashy business. Mm. There's a lot of, uh, it's, it's, it's a sales business selling property. So there's a lot of bouginess, meaning there's a lot of uh, fancy cars and everyone's dressed to the nines and everyone claims to be the number one agent. There's, there's a lot of nonsense, especially in Miami, which unfortunately can be a very superficial city. Uh, I'm glad I live at the northernmost part of Miami where you still see a lot of nice cars, but it's not as flashy. It's less of a touristy area. Uh, Avent I live in Aventura, which is you know, the, pretty much the northernmost part of Miami. So you still have your tourists that come in and out, but for the most part, it's more of a residential local kind of, kind of city, yeah. which I like a lot more. Um, so it's kind of just a matter of ad adaptation, just understanding that I live in a, in a city that's very showy yeah. and, uh, I can understand it. So I think as a realtor, it's important to, if you want to do well, to really know how to pivot. If you're not that kind of person, to so say you're from some random place in Ohio where the, the, you, you really never see any fancy cars or no one's really dressed in, in, in anything. They're not wearing a fur fox. They're not wearing a fox on their neck. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. So, well, they're not doing that in Miami, but you catch my drift. You know, they're, if, it were, if it were colder, they would be. So, so um. Uh, you know, I think it's just really in any, in any business or, or rather in any sales business like real estate, understanding the market and being able to pivot to it. So New York also though, New York has a very, uh, you know, high class materialistic kind of energy, especially in, in the wealthier parts of Manhattan. Yeah. So I think they're luxury agents who do well, who might not be that those kind of people themselves, they know how to put on the, the show. 
they know how to you know connect with those clients because that's how they they get their business yeah have you had any um like crazy closing stories and any, anything you've gone through i had some pretty difficult clients i mean i had um one of my first closings was a very, very nice, very nice woman. Her father was helping her with the down payment and her father was extremely difficult, tried to make sure that he saved every penny possible. And it became very difficult to get the purchase done. I was on the buyer side to get the purchase done because he was so meticulous, so particular on saving every single dollar. Yeah. And I understood it. I mean, I, I tried to really be on his side about it. But it just became very difficult. Thankfully, it closed. I really, really hold on, held on to this transaction. My my client didn't even think it was going to go through because her father was being so difficult. But I sat and had conversations with him on the phone, and I was able to reason with him, and and it went through. But it was a, I mean, it was, it was a job, man. I mean, he got upset at me. He got upset at the the mortgage guy. He got upset at the title company. We thought all of us were unprofessional. You know, he was an old old stubborn guy. I'm not mad at him for it. It is what it is. You can't please everybody. I did my absolute best to be professional and, and be there to serve them. And, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> so sure. she, you know, my client's very happy with me. She always recommends me to people, but, um, you know, unfortunately he wasn't too thrilled. It doesn't okay. seem like, uh, seems like I'm not, we're not the only people that he, he wasn't happy with, but it is what it is. Yeah. And uh, ultimately my client really was, was his daughter, not him. So my, my main goal is to make sure that she was happy and she was very much so. And then I had a seller who I happen to get along with very well, but he's, you know, in his eighties and he's quite stubborn, you know, he's a, he's a very successful guy. And, yeah. uh, it was, it was tough. I had to give up $4,500 of my commission. The buyer's agent gave up 4,500 of hers just to uh, put towards closing costs. Well, to put towards, um, uh, uh, money on the inspection. Mm -hmm. The buyer was trying to get a, a lot of money for, for the inspection. Yeah. So uh, other than that $9,000 credit, the seller would not give any, I mean, the seller didn't give anything. We gave money from our commission, yeah. but it was, it was the last two weeks before closing. We, we, we ended up extending for a little while, but it was just constant back and forth. I ended up the, the day of closing. We, they needed to get their stuff out. I ended up going and I got there at 10 AM. I left at around five, six o'clock and I literally helped them move tons of stuff i wrapped i wrapped up their tvs and towels and blankets i carried these massive plants i sat there just i carried things with the movers just i uh i mean at the end of the day i'm grateful that i'm young and fit enough to be able to do that but if i was like an older person or i wasn't physically strong enough to carry these things i mean the deal wouldn't have i mean it, it might not have closed or it wouldn't have closed on time so uh that was <laughs> it wasn't exactly ideal but at the end of the day, man, it goes back to the army story. If I could go through that, what the hell is a 10 to five move? You know what I mean? What's, yeah. what's a, what's a $4,500 credit in, in, you know, relative to that experience, it's a joke. So it is what it is, you know? Yeah. Piggyback off of that, any interesting sales tips that you give to maybe listening right now and different negotiations that you've been through? Okay. So what I would always say is, and, and again, I'm, I'm still newer, so I don't want to sit here acting like I'm the biggest pro, but at the same time, there are certain things that I've seen are very true. Yeah. Uh, don't be, don't have commission breath. You still there? Okay. You're there. I thought you paused for a second. Okay. Don't have commission breath, which means always try to put your client first. Don't be attached to the outcome. A lot of this I'm actually uh, relaying from my mentor. Don't, don't, you know, don't uh, be too attached to, attach to the outcome. Think about the process. If it doesn't close, if the client doesn't want it, if it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. Don't try to force the deal to close. If you know that both clients want, want it to happen, you just need to work out negotiations, fine. But if it doesn't make sense, it'll be what it'll be. You'll get the next one. Um, I mean, there's so many good, good, uh, good things to understand. When you generate, you don't have to tolerate, which means if you generate enough client business, you don't have to deal with the clients who aren't serious or are, are there to just disrespect you. So when you have very little business, you're pretty much going to take whatever you can get, you're going to be desperate. So, you know, the more you spend, the more time you spend on your business, focusing on your business, you can spend less time in the business, if that makes sense. Yeah.
So, you know what I mean? And it's very important in the early stages of a sales business to really buckle down and do the things you need to do. It's very easy to slack off, happens to everyone. Uh, but the more you can put your head down and keep away from distractions, it'll, you'll end up at that point sooner than later and you'll have more freedom to do the things you want to do. But in the beginning, the first couple of years for most realtors, if they stick it out, because very few do, the, one, the few that stick it out, and they, statistically they say within the first year, over 80% of realtors drop out. Wow. Uh, but if you can stick it out, I mean, sky's the limit. There's really no, there's no ceiling to it. And it's not like we're talking about an MCAT here. It's not a very difficult test. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to be an agent. It's not that you necessarily have to be a brilliant person. What I think makes a good realtor as, as what makes a great salesperson is someone who has great emotional intelligence. They pay attention to detail. They show up on time. They show up 15 minutes early, if anything. They, they, always, do their, they always make it their business to make a great impression. Um, not being attached to the outcome again. Uh, being very strict on schedule, always writing things down and, and, and making everything needs to be on, on a calendar. If it's not on a calendar, it doesn't happen. So, uh, you know, if you have an appointment at four, put it in Google Calendar, set an alarm on your phone. Don't assume you're going to remember. Just make sure it's written down. Um, and again, I have tons to learn, but uh, I mean, I'm, if you don't come from a wealthy family, you're going to have to start from the bottom which I, which is how it is for me. So you're going to have to do the things you don't want to do. You're going to have to make the calls or door knock or whatever, whatever it is that works for you. Uh, from what I've been told and what I see, I feel like cold calls are probably the best route, especially if you don't have thousands upon thousands of dollars to throw at marketing. And yeah, it's going to, it's not going to be easy in the beginning, but uh, eventually you get used to it. And, it, and it's wild that people complain realtors complain about making calls but yet they're sitting in a comfortable chair in air conditioning making phone calls while people are outside in in 90 degree miami weather drilling holes in the ground and making i don't know 10 an hour if if that 12 and yeah. you can potentially make an enormous amount of money from a phone i mean <laughs> need i say more no no you hit the, you hit the nail on the head and a lot yeah. of your, your tips there regardless of your experience level are as valid as ever, you know, because I really believe in never selling to the unsellable, you know, never forcing a sale because it not only does it not make the sale happen, but also just rubs the person the wrong way. And, you know, if that person ever has communication with anybody else you might potentially do business with, you're never going to get the good feedback. Absolutely and not. Right. It's, and it's a smaller world as everybody's, you know, experience at some point. So I think those are very valid tips. Um, and then one of the other things too, you mentioned, um, what was the other one? Oh, generating. Like, like the more that you generate, you have all the leverage. You know, like the more that you generate, if you're a business owner, if you're an agent in real estate, like if you're creating income off of something based on clientele, the more generation you create, the more leverage you have in every facet of the business. Like Absolutely. as well as relationships and like partnerships too. Like think about the amount of partnership, you know, issues that go on. And I've worked with a few of them that have had this issue where one partner like one owner is generating nearly all the business and the other person's not, but they're doing more back end stuff, which is still important and still, you know, valid, just not generating as much business. So it creates some conflict just by nature of that being the case, which can be tough. So focusing on generating more opens up your options in a, in a major way. So I think you're completely right on those tips. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the more, the more value you can bring to the table, the more options you'll have. So you know, when, when you have 50 clients that you're working with, I mean, you have 10 listings, you have seven pendings, you have a bunch coming soon, you have a bunch of people that want to work with you. If you have some, you know, some guy named Sam that uh, wants to sell his property, it's really valued, the market value is 400, but he wants 750. You might have a realtor that says, you know, let me just take it at something, at least I'll have something versus another agent with all of that business already who says, I'm not going to waste my time with this person. Maybe I'll put them in on a drip campaign. Maybe I'll, you know, set them up on automatic emails and maybe they'll come to uh, come to reality at some point, but this way it's automated and I don't have to, you know, spend my time on it. That's one thing, but to sit there and call them every week when this person clearly isn't motivated, clearly isn't ready to, to do what needs to be done. And when you don't have a lot of business, you fall into that trap. So it's very, it's very important mentally, even when you don't have a lot of business, to try to come to terms with focusing on the people that want to be helped, you know, 
Um, and I think that's, that's very important. I completely agree. Well, listen, Robbie, this, I think your experiences have a very unique take and can a lot of people listening, almost everybody I know can resonate with something that either me or you have said, and that is not to be taken lightly. There's a lot of experiences in this life that you can, especially in the business world, including real estate that can shape whatever else you're doing. You know, I think a lot of these things are evergreen and in many different ways. So I genuinely appreciate, you know, your feedback, your takes, your insights, and everything that we've talked about today. It has been an amazing conversation. Took a shot in the dark to make my own lane. I think that I'm better go my own way. So I did and now I'm on my own. Yeah, I'm on my way. Keep my head up till I find my place. Yeah, I'm on my way. Every day I'm getting close. Had to do my own thing.